you, get, you laid a brush on the Santik tablet. You didn't lay it. And there's other issues about thought processes and how you determine that and, <clears throat> and things like that. But no, it, does, it is not nearly as satisfying that I put a piece, my hand on a piece of paper. It's not nearly as satisfying to me. I manipulated the model. One of the things about, well, I'm going to show you in just a minute, actually. Let me do that. Let me show you this. Oh, that's not the one I want to show you, but I'm going to show it to you then. The, the, I'm going to go to another, another issue now. And the issue is uh, going back to the sense of awe. What I'm going to show you is a, a, about a minute and a half from a movie called The Great Escape, which is a, a prisoner of war movie we made years about 1966, I think. Steve McQueen. 63, Steve McQueen. What's real name on his birth certificate? Is Steve McQueen. Terrence Steve McQueen. Oh, well. Steve McQueen. There, there you go. There you go. With an E or an A. It's true. With a Terrence with an E or Terrence with an A? I don't know. Yeah, I see. <laughs> I do know that they misspelled Terrence and Philip in South Park with an A. Yeah, I see. Yeah, Terrence yeah. with an A. Uh, in this scene, in this, uh, yeah. this is a, a very famous scene. When it showed in the theaters in 1963, people gasped at this escape. It's a motorcycle escape. And then I'm going to show you a motorcycle sequence from uh, Matrix uh, Reloaded. OK? Let's go. <laughs> Cool, cool sequence. Best thing in the movie, I thought. Um, the first one was Steve McQueen. Actually, was his stunt man. He, he did almost all the riding, but the actual jump, which was about 50 feet, was a stunt man. And it was a real jump. He really, they really jumped that barbed wire fence. And it was really cool, and we really liked it back then. But it was no long shot, because if they got closer, we would have seen it wasn't Steve McQueen. We couldn't have been gone in and pixelated in space and made it into Steve's face or anything like that. Um, and then we saw a um, matrix and we saw what was essentially was a blue screen shot of them coming over the top of that truck. Blue screen. We all know it. We know that it's a blue screen shot. They go into the choppies, you know. It is a sense, what I call viewer pessimism. I didn't make that, up, that term up. It is a sense that the viewer looks at the thing and goes, well, it's all blue screen. It's done on the computer. Now, say I know the, the, the fact is that it is. That it's a stunt woman doing really good. Now, the, the ping over the truck is, is blue screen. Absolutely. Most of the cars weren't there either. Yes, that's true. Uh, most of the cars are there. I most of them were. No, most of the cars are not. There's, there's footage of it. There's footage. Yeah, she was going through cones, and the cones are removed. And then they added anything that she's getting really close to, like the two trucks going by like that, yeah. weren't there. Cars that are going. There were some cars in the shot, but they're, they're, they're kind of lagging back. But it was really her driving. But viewer pessimism says, it's all CG. If I saw, when I watched Lord of the Rings 3, interment, Lord of the Interminable Rings, and I saw those elephants and 7,000 guys and guys rolling around, and it was really cool to look at, but the back of my mind I was also saying, it's CG. And that becomes this kind of, that also adds the lack of awe, because we know it's not real. But doesn't that come into play with both the examples you gave, both in The Matrix and Lord of the Rings? Yeah. Those are, yeah. those are fantasy to begin with. Yes, they the are. A guy jumping up a barbed wire fence, that's not, that, that's in the realm of reality. Yes. So, and I mean, couldn't that contribute to it? Because in the Matrix, we expect them to basically be superheroes when they're in the Matrix. In right. Lord of the Rings, the Oliphants are obviously fake because my, they don't exist. In the my issue today. would be, let's say they made Great Escape today. What would they have done? When Steve McQueen the queen jumps over. Where he goes over. You go, and he goes, goes, and you see the wheel turning in slow motion, and you see, yeah, and then it goes and goes and goes, and then and the audience knows that it's, in the back of their head, even though it's part of the story and the storytelling, you know, in the back of their head, that. But how would you do Lord of the Rings before special effects? Like, you can't. They, uh, one guy did. Uh, Ralph Bakshi made a Lord of the Rings. I love that book. And he's the only guy that likes it. But it was it was a it was a rotoscoped version of it. And uh, they, by the time he got to that particular part of the movie. Um, uh, they'd run out of money, and it was pretty obvious that the guys were wearing gorilla masks. And <laughs> very, and they actually, they have the series. So. Yeah, yeah. They, they, um, and you're right; you probably could. However, 
as cool as it looked, and it did look cool, to me, it didn't carry the weight. And there's fantasy movies with big crowds. Uh, to me, it did, because I know in the back of my head that it's CG, I can enjoy it for the image, but it doesn't carry the same weight as the idea that there are people involved. Un unlike the people who are actually making it. Yeah, I, kinda, I like just for actually on this stuff, like reality and special effects. And part of it is just, if they're good enough, we like, we should, we should just be in the story. And we should, like, I, I, we should yeah. just watch the visuals and enjoy the story. Not yeah. like, I mean, for us as animators, and or anything, we're all kind of have this idea that we're watching CG, so it's kind of different for us, but for normal people, I think they do, they get lost in the story. I, that's where, that's where, that's where we're going. Yeah, I'm not sure they get lost. In the well, story. I mean, but they're like they're just in, in the moment. It's yeah. Like yeah. A I'm a normal person. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a business major. So <laughs> yeah. I, I get lost in the story. Yeah. And and that's where I'm going to go with this. Yeah. Because my and we'll and we'll go there in a little while. Um, the, my point is, what's the good story? Yeah. I mean, the visual. I think epic visuals. Are just, I mean, I, I like watching like 2012, and because I know things can happen. Like, and by the way, 2012 is a pretty terrible story. It's a horrible story. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, what do we call it? Disaster porn. Yeah. yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. And like, we watch it for. The, for I mean, yeah. in the, a, a more apt comparison to the Stephen Queen movie. Could you say like, uh, like any of the board movies, or say Italian Job, with much more realistic chase scenes? I mean, there's nothing necessarily glaring like, oh my God, it's CG. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like in those examples. And sometimes so I, I would it, say, and, 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 the, and the fact is, sometimes it's not. Yeah, a lot like the Italian job, like the it's very famous, yeah, the yeah. very famous. And like the Bourne identity, they did it all. It's fully, it's, fully real. Real. it's fully real, and that's and what I, what the problem is is when the audience is well at CG, but because it's viewer pessimism. But you know, they don't you think. I don't know. Well, no, that. I mean, they we I think we have a warped sense because we are animated. Like yeah. I look at things and I'm like, oh, what passes are they using, and what's Compton, and what's and, that, and therein lies, the, at the end of it, therein lies the dilemma because that isn't a story. That is a cool technique. I, well, that's for me, though. But yeah, so for the you. Normal for you. person, they're like, oh, cool. Like, sometimes. And that, and, that, and that will be my lament at the end, and it doesn't have to do with CG, it has to do with storytelling. And I think the better they get, too. I, mean, yeah. I think the better the story is, the more what well, people are going to suspend to believe about the effects. Yeah, if the story is so. poor to begin with, a lot of people will be really distracted by that. I, 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 I actually, effects. they think it's better than it is. That's and then you leave and you go, wait a minute, I was eating cotton candy there. Yeah, I, yeah, I thought yeah, it was steak. Yeah. And uh, I don't remember anything about it except the cool visual effects. We'll go there in a minute. Yeah, but the, uh, okay. Jurassic Park I think, did a great job of, even though you knew it was fake, yeah. you kind of felt like you were there. Well, uh, and that, that goes to something Ray Harryhausen told me once about his pictures. Now, when his pictures came out, everybody thought they looked realistic too. Wow, look at the skeletons and, the, and, and Jason the Argonauts and all that, and the giant Cyclops, you know, they thought that was realistic. And today we look, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the next picture, actually, and we'll talk about that. Okay, let me press the button. There you go. The old one and the new one. I like the one from 1970. Yeah, I love them both for different Okay. I like the first one because, we were, you know, we're talking about, you know, that what you're seeing. To me, like the first one, there are moments where I can buy into the fact that this is a giant gorilla mm -hmm. running around a city, and I appreciate that. The second one, I never for a minute think that that's a real gorilla running around a city, but there's something more nostalgic to me about that. I mean, that was the first one that I saw. And I think for me recently, like I was just in California, and they just put up the new King Kong ride or something like that in uh, Universal Studios. And I remember I loved and I remember the, the sad thing for me is like the new ride is pretty much just like the, fir like the, the first one that we saw. It's now all screens and cops like running around on these screens and you sort of are just like on a car like going through it. Right. And I think that the, for me the big difference is I like the first one more as a film where I'm watching it as a spectacle. But when you promise like an interactive experience with someone, I think that that is really important that you be able to see something or get that sense of real texture there. So I really missed like the big animatronic. Animatronic 
In a way, that's the argument I was talking about before, the tactile argument that right. when it is all virtual, it is once again removed. It's a little bit like if, if any of you read Plato's Allegory of the Cave at some point in your career. It, you know, that's the, that's the allegory of film, and we're talking about a shadow of a shadow, in a way. Because, you, and, and the new uh, visual effects in the new Conrad are unbelievable. They're, I mean, the film is fantastic. It's better than I think that. But it is, but again, you kind of miss part of it. You know, when King Kong came out in 1933, people thought that looked real. <laughs> there were guys saying that they were a guy, I was the guy who was King Kong, I was in a suit, it was me, you know, which of course was not true. But there is something evocative about the filmmaking technique. It's also 90, 100 minutes long, the original one. And the new one is twice that length. Tell that story. Too long. Way too long. Even that sequence just felt like it was. Yeah, and, and although you now see Times Square, and you see lots of cars, and there's lots more light, in a way that diffuses and, and by the way, you see a, a repeated beat three or maybe four times. He picks up four, three or four girls and tosses them um, away. We've seen that, but, the, but what happens is because you can do it, and this is one of the arguments, because you can do it doesn't necessarily mean you should do it. CG opens up the fact that you can do it, and you can do it many, many, many times, and realistically. So that it really, I mean, the, the ape in King Kong, the new one, you've got every hair, you've got every reflection in his eye. When he opens his mouth, you can actually see his uvula waving around, you know. The old one, at this kind of furry teddy bear guy, somehow Willis O'Brien and his animating crew got, got a um, performance out of that character. Even though we look at it today and we go, yeah, we, we get it. But there is a performance out of the character, and I maintain that at the end of the movie, when King Kong falls off, you feel bad for him, and you may feel worse for the teddy bear one than the real one. Even though they push the limit, you know, he looks gazingly at her as, he, <laughs> as the bullets fly. <laughs> and somehow, the old one, for some reason, I think it's a filmmaking technique, the fact that it was dark, the fact that they, they used what they could at the time, what we use nowadays is much more complex. We can do much more. We can light it much better. We can show everything much better. And yet somehow that performance of that kind of metal skeleton, I mean, all he had in his the controls in his mouth were basically sculpture wire. You know, basically it was that. Um, somehow managed by uh, some of the fundamental skills to still give us a performance. Not that we should go back to that. We're never going to go back to that again. What we do are allowed to do is, is look at it and appreciate it for what it is. Yeah? So you've basically shown us three remakes so far. Right. The uh, Knights Remember Titanic, the two mm -hmm. Star Wars, and then King Kong. Mm -hmm. Do you think that all also these, um, the newer ones suffer from this uh, kind of expectation that they're going to outdo the beginning ones anyway? And that's why these, you know, that's why basically the Star Wars scene is just blinged up. I mean, it, it doesn't really, there's nothing really add to the story. In terms of elegance, the first one is obviously, it, for, it gets across what it needs to, right. but then there's a sense of, well, we've already done that, we need to add spectacle. Do you, that, think, and do that, you think that these movies suffer from that, kind of aside from... I think they that can suffer about? from what we would call an embarrassment of riches. You know? It's uh, like because we can, we because must. Because we can, we must, and if we don't, the audience will not because, I mean, unless, you, unless you completely blow the other one out of the water, what's the point of remaking it? Yeah, you do, get, do you think these yeah. suffer from that? Well, you know, yeah, yeah I do. I, and I think movies do in general. I think that is the, that's the bad side. I'm going to get to the good side. Don't worry. <laughs> the bad side is that because you can and because the audience sees it, now they want more. So you see Matrix, the original Matrix, and you see Matrix Reloaded, and you see whatever the third one was called, Revolution. Revolution. And the story suffers, although the visual effects are really cool. Um, you see, uh, the other thing about the old King Kong, which I really enjoy, is it's economical. Yeah, the acting is very 30s acting, and yet somehow it seems to fit. And it tells a story like this, and we're done. The new one, I, I watched the one, and I, I, was game, I was game for it. I like Peter Jackson, I like what he had done in some fil films before that. Ray, I asked Ray about it, 
I, and Ray was, she said, I, what do you think? He said, well, I don't know why they're remaking it, but at least Peter Jackson's remaking it. You know? The studio's doing uh, Planet of the Apes, which will be a yeah, lot but, yeah. the original. And, the, and at the, but at the end of the day, it was, you know, the, the, there's a wonderful, I, I could have gone to the dinosaur fight, where Kong fights the Tyrannosaurus Rex, which is a wonderful sequence in the original one, and it jumps the shark in the new one. Well, isn't that what I'm saying? Like, because yeah. the first one had a single Tyrannosaurus Rex, now Let's the second three. one has to have multiple Tyrannosaurus right. Rexes, and we have to jump off cliffs. Right, and, and, to, and, and it, beca it doesn't help the story. The story is a is different story, and, it, and in a way, it gets in the way of the story. Yeah. Actually, I, I think this is analogous to what I perceive go is going on in a lot of fiction books. So back in the old days, even as far back as like the 50s, you'd have a story that'd be 300 pages in a book. Right. Now, they have these scenes where they describe in graphic detail, I touched the door, I felt the tingling of the static electricity, I opened the door, there's Ikea furniture, you know, all this detail about every room and every scene, and the books are now 900 pages long instead of 300, and, you know, there's a lot less story there because it's diluted over the whole yeah. book. And I Although, find it, try and read Moby Dick. <laughs> you know, that one, that, that, that's kind of, but, but the but you look, and, and and actually I think reading Moby Dick is pretty hard, or Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. It's pretty hard to read the original. So there is that, te but there's that tendency, and when you have the ability to do that, and you have the demand, what ends up what ends up I think suffering often and not always, and we're going to go to that in a minute, is the story. The story suffers because, and and in fact. Lots of remakes. And I'm, where's the original one? Where's the new one? Lots of remakes. Because now we can, you know, it used to be, well, remake it because it'll be in color. Okay, now we're going to remake it because we can do all the stuff. And then what happens, you begin to wallpaper the story with stuff. Or you say, well, what's the Transformers 3? You know, and you're going, and, and people go, and they like watching it, and they like watching all that stuff. But at the end of the day, it, it's, it's, not a, it's not an advancement of story, and to me, story has always been, for everything we've ever done, in film and before that, story is the end game. And if you ask executives in the movie business, they will all tell you that. But the fact is, well, not all of them, some of them will say, black ink in the books and the kiss at the end. <laughs> so, so. Um, uh, but for me, that, that is the lament. Now, can technology help tell a story? You bet. And that's where it gets really good. I'm going to show you just sequences uh, cut together to music of a film that I think technology did so much to help tell. It's a very difficult film to watch. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. It's very difficult. It's not a, it's not a fantasy film. It's not a... It's, in fact, it's, a, it's based on an actual historical event. That's a great and very underrated movie called Changeling. Anybody ever see it? Yep. It's a great movie. Um, and it is a, a, a very dour and, and actually pretty scary, um, uh, sad and tragic story about a woman whose son disappears and was probably killed by a serial killer in California in, the, in, the, in 1929. And nobody in that movie goes, oh, look at the CG in that. And there's lots of it all over the place, about 90 shots altogether, and most of them fairly complicated ones. The landing shot where, where she looks at the camera and then walks away, she changes to a CG character. All the rest of that shot is CG. And there's several of those. The cab pulling up and she gets out. It's just a cab and her. The rest of it was created. And what it does is put us where we need to be in the story in the environment of the story. Part of the story is what happened to this woman in that time. And it needed to it would be evocative of that time. And it certainly was. You see the red car, which doesn't exist anymore, and it hasn't existed for since the 40s, I think. And, and you see the, all the old cars, of most of which were, of course, created as well. Most of the people were, too, in a lot of the, in a lot of the shots, anyway. And um, it, it beautifully helps Clint Eastwood tell the story. Clint Eastwood is a very interesting director. I once um, got to see a lecture with his DP, and his DP said that he often wanted shots to be 
lit very uh, quietly so that the audience would bring more of them to the story than him telling them what to think. And that is one of the issues about being able to create many images. The more stuff you can show, the less the audience has to do. Often, not always, the more stuff he showed, he didn't really, he didn't say, he didn't point to it and say, look at the, all this fantasy stuff. And it wasn't fantasy, it's, it's real. And it worked great. The movie's terrifically, and she's great in it, Angelina Jolie's great in it, the, the whole cast is great, you should see it. However, you won't want to watch it twice, right? It's very difficult to watch. Um, but it is a wonderful movie, and it tells the story really well. Uh, and I think that that's part of what I, I, um, I want, well, everybody, everybody who works in, in visual effects loves to make movies where nobody knows, knows it's a visual effect. We all love that. Because it's, it's, we, the, that's the stuff we, that's the meat we really want. We want to do stuff where nobody says, that was a visual, even if it's a fantasy film. That was a visual. No, they want, they want you to believe that the Transformer guy is a real guy. They want to light it properly, and they want it to have emotion and all that. What I, what I worry about is that because we can bring everything to it, at least what we think we're bringing it. Look, the guys who make King Kong, they were bringing everything to it, too, the original one. And, and I would suspect maybe in, in 30 years, when we look back at this King Kong or Lord of the Rings, we will all say, well, that looks pretty fake, because they'll be even better. There's no getting the genie out of the bottle. I, I, but I found an interesting thing uh, just the other day, a, a quote, and I'll tell you who said it afterwards. It's, it's somebody um, famous. I think what a lot of action movies lose these days, especially the ones that deal with fantasy, is you stop caring at some point because you've lost the human scale. With, C, with CG, suddenly there's a thousand armies, a thousand enemies instead of six and the army goes off into the horizon. You don't really need that. The audience loses its relationship with the threat on the screen. That's something that's consistently happening and makes these movies like video games, a soulless experience. It's all kinetics without emotion, and I don't have time for that. The quote is from Harrison Ford. And the movie, Han Solo, Hans Bolo. So. It, it, uh, kind of an interesting thing. What he's lamenting is something that I, when it becomes a, because it can be so real, and you can get a visceral feeling from the CG, it can be an excuse to not tell the story well. What we all try and do in, in our business, always, in whatever movie we're making, unless we're a very cynical person, is a simple story well told. That's what we try for. And we, and, and oftentimes it's not a very good story, and so we window dress it, and it becomes an eye candy story. And an eye candy story um, may not, may be told interestingly, but at the end of the day, not well. What I worry about, the only thing I really worry about, is the idea that the newer generations will substitute good story for good looks. And we all know it's better to marry somebody who's a good person rather than just a good looking person because the good looks will fade eventually. So uh, so I, I wondered when I started, was it just me being a curmudgeon and an affection for the old days because it was my generation and Ray Harryhausen was my visual effects guy and they never looked real and I asked Ray about it and he said I didn't mean them to look real. They were supposed to be a dream. Nobody really believes there's a cyclops if, unless they're seven years old like I did. It, you know what, it's a dream. We used to know when those scenes started because they, they look, the film looked different because the, it, it, an animated stop frame character didn't have any motion blur on it. Uh, but he said, and they were supposed to be, you were supposed to go into a dream. That was what I was trying to do. And I wonder, uh, and, and I wonder if, we, if, we, if we're gonna lose that. Um, after all, for me, it was the technology that brought me into the business in the years when there wasn't very much technology, just film technology and force perspective and the Xerox machine. Um, and I suspect that for you, except maybe you, the business guy, you're in this business because there's a film like this that brought you in, Star Wars or Toy Story 1 or something. And I could probably go here and you could probably tell me which one it was. That you kind of said, I want to do that. For me, it was Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. 
but at that time, that was the head of, that was the first color film that had giant monsters in it. You couldn't do it before that time. Uh, it, so that magic button that I talked about at the beginning, uh, this kind of this kind of thing where a machine will, you will press the button and a good film will come out, has never been true. The first guy asked me about a magic button, asked me about a magic button in about 1975, and he, swear, he said, where's the magic button? I know you guys don't do all that work. Where's the magic button? And, and I said, we do. And there's lots of studios today in this world that they see the Autodesk demo and they think there's a magic button too. And they buy 200 seats of Maya and they get people off the street to run them. And then two years later they hire me because they don't know why their stuff looks like shit. <laughs> and, I, and so the magic button's been very good to me because it's not real. It is a fable. It is a, it is a wish for people who want to make money quick or want something to happen fast. And as we all know, once you learn the magic button, you find out it isn't magic at all and it's just us behind the screen. I'm hoping that there will be more films that use our magic button, not so much like the Changeling because that's only one kind of film, but even in the big fantasy films that, that begin to remember that there is a sense of scale, that we don't have to put every leaf on every tree and we don't have to put every 6,000 characters in if we can do it with only four. In the, in the days when it had to be real people, we had to do that. The budget and the, and the realistic fact that we could only put so many people on a set at a certain time forced that. Today, we have everything, or at least we think we do. And, uh, and, and then it becomes a matter of taste and discipline and, and back to real storytelling that I hope happens. So that's basically it. And I think it will, by the way. I think it's already starting to. You know, my grandfather got an eight millimeter camera when he, uh, uh, um, back in about 1960, and he went off to Europe and he took pictures and they looked like this. And it had a zoom lens on it. And it went, everything went He couldn't even watch it. You know, fast pan, I'm getting everything in, fellas. You know, I got the whole thing. And, and of course the film was crappy. You have to learn what you're capable, what the, what the technology is capable of, and then use it to its best possible degree. And I think we've kind of gone that way, and I think we're starting to go back. And use the technology in a more tasteful, better, story-oriented way. I hope. By the way, the Harry Hausen films weren't very good either. Well, I think uh, Pixar shows hope for the future. Fantastic Absolutely. story, characterization. Absolutely, and I think there are other, uh, other films too. I, I think we rely too much, maybe right now, because we can on, on very... Look, even the comic book films are mythology. I mean, they are, they are a version of mythology. I'm not just talking about the Hestor or, or right, Odin, right. but, but even, the, even the Batman story and the Superman story are myth mythological uh, uh, ideas and, and, and can be the basis for really good stories. When the, when the audience demands better stories, when they start realizing they're eating a lot of cotton candy, uh, I think we'll, we'll start to see that. And when some of the filmmakers get back to, to economy, uh, like Clint Eastwood, um, even, in the, even in the mythological stories, get back to that sense of scale, I think that's what was missing. And believe me, when they were writing the King Kong picture, it was all about, oh, it's going to be a love story between the two characters and sense of scale. It didn't work. They got too complicated. Uh, and, and, and they kept, you know, they kept talking about how good the gorilla looked. They did. They looked great. All have muscles. <laughs> so, uh, but I think they are, and I hope so, and I want them to. Uh, and, and it's not just them; it's me. I work in the same business. And uh, so, any questions, comments, criticisms? Throw me twenty dollars, whatever. You want. Uh, I hope you guys get to work on some really great stories. Um, you'll find that when it is a really great story, you will be so much happier than when you're just doing eye candy. Which you will do. Part of the and you know what? I, I, it isn't the lack of the old days. If you go back and look at the old films from the 30s, most of the, the, the grand majority of that stuff wasn't very good either. It was programmers and, you know, it, it, what they did use instead of visual effects then was, was big movie stars. 
and they quit Gene Harlow in the next picture, quit Clark Gable in the next picture. Most of those pictures weren't very good, but some of them really were. And the ones that have lasted and become classics were all about story at the end of the day. Even King Kong, if you break it down, simple story well told, even though it was a visual effects driven film. I'm not saying visual effects driven films can't be good, because they can be. They can be. Any, any other thoughts or ideas, questions, fun? Yeah. What do you um, what do you think about other technologies like motion capture in terms of what's animation? Um, you know, I, I know lots of motion capture guys, um, and and um, I I, we, I asked this once to a friend of mine who's a Disney guy, and he I had a panel once, and it was all the different kinds of animation. We had a traditional animator, and we had a stop frame guy, and we had a motion capture guy, and we had a puppet capture guy, and a flash person, two D, and um, the motion capture guy. Went, came in like this, oh, big, big yellow screen at me. Mm -hmm. And he, was, he, would, he had just finished Beowulf, which I think is a really terrible film. Really terrible. Really terrible. One of the worst ones. To ask me how I really think about it. Um, but he was, he was all nervous that they were going to jump all over Nobody jumped all over him. And, in fact, Don Hahn was a producer on um, Eating the Beast and, and Aladdin, not Aladdin, and Lion King, whatever else, Little Mermaid, whatever, a Roger Rabbit. Um, he said if Walter had motion capture, he would have used it. He did use rotoscoping. They didn't admit it at the time, but they used plenty of it. Plenty of it. Um, and uh, so I believe motion capture is uh, absolutely viable, really well used in certain areas. I think the problem with motion capture is when it's simply used straight as motion capture. Because to make it successful, you've got to go back into it and actually do a lot of work. Randy Cook, who was supervisor on this picture, well, um, a golem, he supervised on the golem and stuff like that, was really annoyed with the publicity for those pictures because they were calling what they did motion capture and uh, electronic makeup. In other words, Andy Circus paraded around doing his stuff and they motion captured it and then they just laid all the CG over it. And that was not true. You had to go into it a lot uh, and, and make it look, give it more weight. You still have to do that. Uh, uh, I was just talking to some game guys who run uh, one of the, the Triart game company, and they do well, one of the big shooter games now. And they, they use a lot of motion capture, and all game companies do. And the real good ones uh, spend a, an inordinate amount of time <laughs> fixing the motion capture to look like it really works, that it really is a character. And it was the same with rotoscope. When rot rotoscoping, filming, and then tracing, I um, for fortunately got a chance to meet the guy who did a lot of the work on Snow White, Grim Natwick. And Grim told me that they wrote, of course they wrote a scope turf, but they really, you, you couldn't just trace off March Champion, who was the woman. You couldn't just trace her off. Uh, and the better animators uh, used it sim almost as a reference point. And in motion capture, that's really the, the way you have to do it well. Who knows how it will change. But um, uh, I think that, um, there have been some successful motion capture films. Uh, Monster House was one. Uh, but most of the time, it hasn't worked well, uh, as rotoscoping usually did, unless it was used properly, you know, like in Snow White. Uh, it, so that's what I think about it. Absolutely viable. Anything else? Any other questions? Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I did. <laughs> <laughs>